Please stand if you're able as we continue our worship with the reading of God's Word. Our text today is in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You can be seated. Well, good morning again. How's everybody? You guys excited? We're officially in the run-up to Christmas, right? I mean, you don't get to go out to the stores the way maybe you did before. They'll, they'll bring the boxes to you, right? Right, room service. They'll bring the boxes to you. Um, how many of y'all grew up in a place where there were four distinct seasons? Anybody here do that? Okay, maybe half, maybe, or 40%. Um, yeah, I grew up in northern Illinois, and I can guarantee you there were four very distinct seasons. Hot, 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 hot. I felt hotter and more humid than here in the, in the dead of the summer. But in the winter, bitter cold, when, when, when December rolled around, you were looking at ice and snow. And so as kids, we used to... Um, wake up every day. We had chores that our parents gave us then. Um, I, think, I don't know if chores are out of style now or what, but we had chores and we'd have to wake up and we'd have to go outside and we'd have to break the ice and shovel and lay down the salt on the driveway and sidewalk and this kind of thing. Because if you didn't do that, somebody would fall. People would fall. So you had to do it, right? But all of that that weather, the snow, would get us oriented towards Christmas time. Because we'd be out there building snowmans. And we'd be out there laying down in the city. You guys ever see this, those of you who didn't uh, grow up like this? We'd be out there in the winter making angels on our backs in the snow, getting, getting really uh, cold and sick so that mom and dad could patch us up. I literally had strep throat every, every winter while I was growing up. I just thought strep throat was part of life. I thought you just get strep throat. It wasn't until I moved east as an adult that I stopped getting strep throat. I went, wait a second, this was because of the winters in northern Illinois. But we'd also walk places, you know, as kids. We'd walk for miles, a mile, two miles, three miles. We used to walk sometimes four and five miles to the mall on the other side of town. And we'd get in trouble there sometimes. You know, we'd get there too late. We'd be there after dark. And then we'd have to call mom and dad. And mom and dad would come to get us and bring us home. You know, many a times when I was in trouble someplace, I was a naughty, naughty kid, mom or dad would have to come pick me up and bring me home. They'd have to come get me, right? They'd have to come get me. But I love those days, and I love looking forward to Christmas. Now then, we all cherish our families as those closest to us, our natural biological families. Our family has always been there for us and always been with us, and we feel that they always will. They are those who will never betray us, never forsake us, never give up on us, and always support us. So what happens when the Christian life does not line up with family? Now, I looked around, and I didn't see anybody doing a sermon on just these two verses. And I think that's a shame because these are extremely important verses. These are perhaps some of the two most difficult verses in the entire Bible. I will compare them to Romans or any doctrinal book in terms of their emotional difficulty. How many of you ever heard that it's not people with a high intellectual IQ that succeed, but a people with, and I'm not sure that's entirely true, but people with a high 
emotional IQ. Have you ever heard that? Anybody heard that? These verses require a very high emotional IQ to understand and assimilate as a Christian into your life. What happens in your life when your faith goes in a different direction than your family? And what if your family actually opposes your faith? Today in our scripture, we see that after calling the 12 apostles, after beginning to lay the foundation for the new Israel, Christ's own family, his own people, as the scripture says, come out against him. To be honest, in the flesh, in the natural man, this is almost predictable. Now, at first blush, if you'll look down with me at Mark 3, at, at first blush, you might wonder, what do verses 20 and 21 have to do with verses 13 and 19? Or with 22 to 35? But then, by God's grace, you see that verses 20 and 21 have everything to do with both the verses before and the verses after. With those before, because with the 12 apostles, we talked about the, the, the making of the 12 apostles last week. With the 12 apostles, Jesus is establishing a new family, a new people, a new community, a new Israel and church. With those after, because starting with verse 21, the old family... The old people, the old community, and the old Israel react, and they react strongly. In fact, you could perhaps go back even further and say this is an extension of the new wine in the new wineskins and the old wine in the old wineskins in chapter 2, verses 22, verse 22. In any case, What's happening now as Jesus begins to form his new people and family is that his old people and family come out against him and they come out hard. I call the next three messages, then we'll have a Christmas message, I call the next three messages flesh resistance to Christ, I'm sorry, fresh, re, and it is flesh also, fresh resistance to Christ's ministry. This is part one today, family. Fresh resistance to Christ's ministry. This is part one, family. So you can already see this is an emotionally deep and hard topic. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, willingly went to the cross, died for our sins, and rose. And, and in, in his ministry, our Lord formed a new family, a new community. Sometimes we call it the church. Sometimes we call it the kingdom. Sometimes we call it God's people. But those of us who follow God the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ are now called the sons of God, the children of God, the children of God. So, Lord, we thank you for this new family. We don't think about everything that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had to go through to form his people and his family. But, Lord, we thank you that you teach us these things in your word because it is through these things that we can truly appreciate our Christian family and also truly appreciate our natural family. Thank you for these things, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, of course, the overview I've given you so far is a spiritual overview. When it comes to day-to-day -day life, nothing will hurt more than when your own family and people are out to get you. So let's start out by saying Jesus' family and loved ones care for him. Jesus' family loves and cares for him. Our sermon today, title today, as I said, is Fresh Resistance to Christ's Ministry, Part 1, Family. So point one is the situation, that's verse 20, 
And point two is the family grip. That's verse 21. Let's look at verse 20. And as I said, these verses are also connected to what's after, and we'll see that, we'll see that later in sermons two and three, especially three. Okay, look at verse 20. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. Now, Mark is brief here in his language, but the situation is really beyond anything you and I can think or imagine. Jesus is out there with his newly made 12 apostles, and the people are swarming around him. Remember, we've seen some of this in the last few weeks. They're swarming like the starving swarm among food or those with no water around the well. How many of you have have been in or lived in a country or been in a situation where you don't have adequate food for whatever reason, right? In a third world country, if you go live in a third world country, when I was uh, 20 20 and 21, I, I lived on rice, alone every day, one egg maybe every week or two, day, two days a week, and I lived that way for six to eight months. I was really thin. I was so thin you guys wouldn't even recognize me now from that experience. But when, when you're in an environment where you don't have much food and food comes, you go right to the food. You go right at the food, whether it's, whether it's you by yourself or in a group of people. You go right for the food and the water. And so the scripture is teaching us here, in this culture, of course, they don't have much food. There's not a lot of food around. And so Jesus being too busy to eat, he's really busy, super busy. That's what's being said here. He must be starting to lose it, that he's too busy even to eat. He's healing the sick, the hurt, the afflicted. He's casting out demons like flies from the light. He's so busy that he doesn't have time to eat. That's the key phrase here, the key clue. Remember, Jesus and his followers are not in America in 2020. There's no McDonald's, Subway, or Arby's. Domino's does not deliver. Food is in short supply. In this culture, it's a big, big deal to eat. It's a big deal to eat, and you make a big deal of eating. Remember kosher, kosher. In their culture, food was ritualistically and ceremonially part of life. If you were too busy to eat, and too busy to eat properly, You were simply too busy. You had gone off the rails. So Jesus' family, Jesus' people, gets word of these scenes, of everything Jesus is dealing with, with the mob and the crowd, the healing, the the demons, that he's he's, uh, not not well, he's not eating. And they also get word of Jesus' conflict with the religious establishment. And they're concerned for him. They make their way to Capernaum from Nazareth to Peter's home. Now, before leaving this uh, point, let's just bring it down to earth a little bit. Wives, how many of you cook for your husbands? If you're a wife and you cook for your husband more than two or three days a week, raise your hand, please. Okay, many of you. Many of you. Okay? And right, he comes home to dinner, and you, in many cases, you have dinner together as a family. Even in Northern Virginia, you try to do that, right? Even in Northern Virginia, you try to do that. Now, what, wise, are you going to start thinking if day after day and week after week, your husband is too busy at the office to any longer ever have dinner with you? And in fact, more than that, he's too busy to be eating at all. And you're starting to see him day after day not eat. Well, I'll tell you what you're going to do, wives. 
if I can speak for you, you're going to intervene because you're worried. You're going to have a conversation with your husband where you say, what is going on? What's wrong with you? What's happening? And then when he tells you that the local business leaders and the local politicians, that would be equivalent to Jesus' situation, that the local business leaders and local politicians are out to get you and that you're working your butt off and that you have all the people who work for you, the 12 apostles also grinding themselves into the ground, then as a wife, you're really going to start to get worried. Do you see? This is a desperate situation that is developing for Jesus' ministry. And so this brings us to point two. They want to intervene. The family does. This brings us to point two of our sermon, the family grip. Please read verse 21 with me. Let's read it slow. When his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. This is probably one of the most heart-wrenching scenes in all of Scripture. We can tend to go by it, but think about it. Think about it. Jesus' own family and Jesus' own people having this view of him. Remember in another place in Scripture it says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown. Jesus' family does two things here. One, they say, he's out of his mind. He's lost it. He's gone crazy. But they don't stop there. The second thing they do is they go out to, they aim to, Seize him. They aim to seize him. Uh, Ruth, I don't think, has ever had to participate, and she's not going to have to participate much here. Will you stand up for a second, Ruth? If I say to Ruth, hey, Ruth, can, will you come over here? Is that okay? Is that okay, guys and gals? Is that okay to do? Now, I'm not going to, I'm not actually going to physically lay hold, right? But well, I'm not going to apply any. But, but if I go to Ruth and I seize her and I grab her and I carry her off kicking and screaming somewhere, is that okay? No. Not Ruth okay. says no, it's not okay. Not. not okay. Not okay with her, not okay with me not okay with you. That's what Jesus' family has come to do. This word for seize is not some kind and gentle word. It means, it can also be translated, it means to lay hold of, to capture, to arrest, to seize. We are talking about an abduction here. We are talking about coming and grabbing the Lord Jesus Christ and physically restraining him, taking him out of this situation and taking him back to his hometown. Taking him back to his people, to his natural family. They hope they can get him home and there he, the Lord Jesus Christ, can rest and come back to his senses. Again, this comes to the heart of the matter which Jesus later addresses in verses 31 through 35, and just will cheat a little bit and look forward, and look at the very end of 35. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And it brings the question, do we do what God wants us to, or what others, even those we love most like our family, want us to do? Now, this is the right time to state the difficulty of our faith and ministry. Uh, I remember one time at First Baptist, I had a friend. He was a deacon. He was a lawyer. And we'd go out to lunch and hang out and stuff. He was about my age. And he made the argument to me 
that one of the proofs of Jesus' Jesus' deity was that his family never came out against him. They supported him in every way. Well, my friend meant well, but that's just not right scripturally. John 7, 5 says, for not even his brothers believed in him. My friend can be forgiven for this mistake. Lawyers need evidence. In reality, Jesus experienced everything we will ever experience or the import of it. He cares for us this way. He's incarnational. If we are going to experience resistance in our faith and resistance to our ministry from our family and friends even, we can rest assured that Jesus has already first experienced this at a greater level. So what about your life? What did your family, those who do not believe, say when you became a Christian? And even if your parents and family members are believers, what did they say, how did they act when you told them you were going to give up your job or your house or your belongings or your privacy for the ministry? whether that ministry was as a missionary or simply the Christian next door. You know, the reality of Christian faith is that it's radical. Somebody wrote a book with that title. The reality of Christian faith is that it is radical and that you give up your life in, to, and with Christ. It calls us to things, to give, to give up all of ourselves, all of our things, in and with Christ. And it calls us to things which are not ordinarily done. Now this is the part that's really important for you as a believer in a culture that is not Christian. On a day-to-day level, Christ and your faith calls you to things that are not ordinarily done. For example, moving people who are downtrodden into your house. That might be something that the Lord Jesus Christ calls you to, right? Or selling your home in order to serve more faithfully. That could be something... Christ calls you to. You can quickly see this principle at work, right? We just had the 12 apostles. Jesus and the 12 apostles gave up their jobs and lives for ministry and to serve. Now, here's the hard part. It's always been this way. It always will be this way. They were thought to be crazy, were these many of these apostles, I'm sure, by their family and friends, And if we are following Christ very zealously, very ardently, very faithfully, very closely, we will at times be thought of as flat-out crazy by people of the world. I don't want you to be ignorant of this fact, brothers and sisters, because in some ways the greatest impediment to Christian service and ministry is natural family. How does this apply to you? Number one, if you want to take on more ministry, if you're called to a given ministry, your spouse must be on board. Your spouse must be... How many of you feel called to specific ministries? Okay. Your spouse must be on board. Is you're an adult... Your spouse must be on board. Does your, do your parents need to be on board? No. Do your cousins need to be on board? No. Do your aunts need to be on board? No. Do your grandparents need to be on board? No. Your spouse, though, must be on board because you're in a one flesh relationship. Number two, you must be clear about God's call, calling, and will in your life. Don't take on ministries without the support of God. God's support also involves your pastors and the church's support. 
That's how ministry works. Because the reality is that you'll face resistance from other quarters, hard resistance. You know, uh, we just had uh, our first this morning, before this message, we just had our first digital interruption. You know the other interruptions we had? Crystal was supposed to do the announcements today. She got a flat tire on the way to church. I had three or four major obstacles this morning to getting to church. I barely made it here on time. The reality is we will face real obstacles to doing ministry. Ministry is hard. You have to know that you're called by God, gifted and equipped by God, and also that your spouse is on board. Really 100% on board, but on board, right? That has to be in word and deed. Because you will get hard resistance from all other quarters, including at times family and friends. Now, uh, I hope you won't begrudge me uh, telling, uh, telling a story from my own, uh, my own younger days becoming a Christian. How, how many of you grew up in the church? Can I ask that? Okay, how many of you did not grow up in the church and became Christians after age 18? Okay, so we got actually probably a higher, you know, nationwide, I think only 3% of Christians become a Christian after age, I forget whether it's 25 or 27, which was the case for me at 28. So I I know I'm kind of like, it's a little weird that way. Um, But most people who are Christians grow up in the church, and that's a different family situation, but still... It's going to be very difficult if you really go out on a limb for ministry. Um, you know, if, and I don't want to sort of hurt anybody's feelings, and I hope this won't do that. I'm not picking on any of you in particular who I call out, so don't feel like that, feel that way. But, you know, if, if Mark, if Mark decides that he's going to up in tomorrow, uh, because he feels God call him to not, not practice as an electrician anymore, and that instead of that, he's going out to the missionary field, some family members are going to have something to say about that. Right? Marvin, if Marvin decides that he's not going to be, be a CPA anymore tomorrow, but, that, but he, he and the family are called to Uganda to do missions, Right? Some family members, and I mean besides Karen the kids, some other family members are going to have something to say about that. Right? I mean, my own, uh, my own father-in-law, uh, General McGrath, who's a great guy, always a mentor to me, cared for me very much, always gave me good advice. I was so excited to call him, tell him I was called to ministry. I did it face-to-face. He was one of the first people I talked to, and he... And he looked me in the eyes and said, you're going to give up your career to be a pastor? And what he meant by that is, are you nuts? That's the way he said it. He said it like, are you nuts? And then when I said, when I said to him that, um, yes, that the Lord had worked this way in my life, then he went deeper. Kathleen's dad is a smart, smart guy. Then he went, he went deeper. He said, what if you lose your home doing this, your house? And I said, I don't think that will happen, but if it does, that will be okay. And then when I answered that way, he said to me, he looked me in the eyes and he said, what if you lose your marriage doing this? Now that was not a question. That was a threat. That was a threat. My father-in-law was telling me, who had always supported me in clear, unambiguous language, if, if you decide to do this, not only may you no longer have my support in this marriage, but I may actually actively seek for you not to be married anymore to my daughter. You see, When we give up our lives for Christ and his calling, other family members will react. They will respond. 
Now, why do I feel it's so important for you to know these things? Because, brothers and sisters, there's not a Christian here who doesn't have some type of calling on their life. I don't mean as an adult. I don't mean as a pastor or a missionary necessarily. Sure, of course, most are not called to these things. But some calling to some ministry, and, 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 and you know in your heart you're supposed to be doing it, but there's something holding you back. And a big part of what's holding you back, if you really started to dig below the surface, might be friends or family or people's opinions. And if that person, if any of those people are other than your spouse, you've, you've, really, you've got to really carefully think about that and say like Peter did, is it right for me to do and follow? Is it, Peter said, for us, what the Lord says or what man says? Please turn to Matthew 10, 35. This passage is in a similar place to where we are in the book of Mark. You think, well, we haven't made a lot of progress in Mark yet. We're only still on Mark 3, but wait a second. We, in these other books, we'd be in Luke 6 or Matthew 10 or whatever. We've made a lot of progress in terms of the overall description and reality of Christ's ministry on the ground. So, so but look at how Matthew uh, 10 begins. It, it begins with the 12 apostles, which we had last week. So we're in a very, very similar place. Okay, but then go a little bit further, and where we're going to read is still in chapter 10 at 1035. And these are hard verses, just like our verses today. They're very hard verses. For I have not, for I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Why? Because Christ wants to cause trouble? No, of course not. But because we are to follow the will of God and we're to be liberated in Christ to do the ministry that he would have us to do. And by the way, my father-in-law begrudged me for about five or six months and then our relationship went totally back to normal. Let me keep reading. Verse 37. So that, that's all preamble to verse 37, right? Let me read them again. 36, 35 and 36. I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. That's all preamble to this. Verse 7, 37. Why? Because whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter, I mean mothers, I know how much you love your daughters. I know how much you love your daughters. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Verse 38, whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And now here's the clouds parting and the sun shining through, and why all of this makes sense, and why it's all worth it, and why we should faithfully, even in these things, well, we should, of course, but why we should faithfully in all of these things follow Christ, even though it looks so difficult and impossible. Look at the last verse in this part, 39. Whoever finds his life will lose it. That's what we're, that's what we're talking about, we don't want to do that. Verse, and the end of it, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever does these things that we're talking about and truly crosses over into Christ and life with him 
in his community, in his family, whoever truly does these things, whoever fully commits himself to the Lord, will truly, truly find their life. And then guess what? Then guess what? Then your relationships with your kids. Then your relationships with your parents. Then your relationships with your friends. Then your relationship with your family members. Then they go right. Before that, they were not going right. They could even have been shading into idolatry. Right? My dad and I have a pretty good relationship. It's not perfect. He's not a Christian, right? I'm, I'm not a perfect son, right? He was very against it when I became a Christian. I won't tell you that story this morning. He was very, very against it. But as I developed in faith, our relationship got better, not worse. See, as you give your life up for Christ, your relationship ultimately with your family members and with your children and with your parents will get better. It will get better. But that's not to say that you don't have to have that crossover point where you truly recognize that you, in the final sense, are a child of God. You belong to the Lord. You belong to him and his family. And by God's grace, your natural family will also. Anyone who engages in ministry, whether full-time or in their regular job, will face the threat of privation, poverty, hardship, as well as scorn and misunderstanding from family and friends alike. In our scripture today, Jesus' family says he's lost his mind. This is another thing you'll face as you get more involved in ministry. Other people, officials, coworkers, friends, perhaps even family members will think you've gone nuts. You know, American Christians today are feeling the pressure of a society that basically looks at us as not as good people, sometimes as bigots, sometimes as um, other terms I won't say. And this hurts our feelings. It hurts our feelings because we're sensitive, caring people. But you know what? This is exactly what we should expect. This is exactly what... We should expect these. They think we're crazy. They don't understand. The, the, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. So, so if they thought Jesus is crazy because of his faith, they're certainly going to think you and I are crazy. And this happens a lot. Look, look at Acts 26 with me. Verse 19. Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Now look, the same thing happens to Paul, but from a different party. Well, actually from his people, just like Jesus, from his people. You could translate their family uh, in our verses, this people, the way that, reason they translate a family is because in the later verses they do. They use that word. But anyway, for this reason, the Jews, his people, seized me, says Paul. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Just as Christ is trying to be seized by his people and family, Paul also trying to be seized. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses would say come to pass, that the Christ must suffer and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and the Gentiles. And now here's the response. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Again, the same Thing as our verses. Your great learning is driving you out of your mind. This is how worldly people will respond 
to the Christian message and to the ones who bring it. Some questions. How have you prepared, this is about preparation, how have you prepared to deal with adversity to your ministry from family and friends? If you have never prepared to deal with adversity to ministry from family and friends, then you're going to get held up. Number two, what ministry have you been called to but are not doing because a family member, other than your spouse, other than your spouse, who you have a one flesh relationship with, because a family member is holding you back. If you're truly called, you do well to remember that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Now, I know these are hard, hard things to think about. I have a question for you. When it comes to our lives, do we want the truth even when something's hard? Or do we want it easy? And it not be the truth. Lillian said the truth. We want the truth even when it's hard. I mean, this applies to our lives today. Right? We want the truth. Right? You're thinking about you're probably thinking about right now, because it's all over the news, you're probably thinking about whether or not to take this vaccine, right? I'm, I'm thinking about it and praying about it, kind of. Kind of thinking about it. <laughs> not thinking too hard about it, honestly, but a little bit. Do you want the truth about the vaccine and its side effects? And then decide when you have all the information whether or not you should be taking the vaccine. That's what I want. I don't want to just take the vaccine with incomplete information. I want to know what the side effects of the vaccine are. I want the truth. I want to, even if it's hard, even if it would be easier just to say, hey, stick me, I want the truth. The truth is, the truth is, that we, as Christians, sacrifice everything to find our lives with the Lord. And, 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 and we will face this adversity. We will face this adversity, even from those that we love. But yet, and here's the amazing thing, and I don't want anybody to be discouraged by all these things. Here's the amazing thing of it all. When you follow the Lord's will, you'll receive great blessings even back into those relationships. Look, look, look with me back at Mark just for a second, and then we're going to close. The end of this section that we're on, this is all one section. It starts in 20 and ends in 35. The end of this section is whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. When we fully commit to the will of God, whatever that means for the rest of our life, when we do that, then we can receive the full pour of God's grace. Again, not just into our own lives, but even into our family's life, even into our church family's life, even into our children's lives, even into our parents' lives, even to our natural family's life. But unless you're willing, unless you're willing to fully commit to the Lord, you won't get there. And Christ has demonstrated his full commitment to us because he died for our sins. And so as we remember that, and remember that we have a risen life with him, it engenders confidence for us 
to fully commit ourselves to him. Whoever loses his life for Christ's sake will find it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Lord, it must have indeed been hard. It must have, to feel those emotions when your family members come to grab you and take you away. And when they cast doubt or they speak against your ministry. And Lord, you persevered through it all and you persevered not only not only yourself, but for our sake, and you persevered following the will of God. So Lord, please help us to be faithful. Help us to persevere even in difficult family situations, whether that's witnessing to the family member who doesn't believe, or whether that's being in the face of others that, that, that think we just don't get it. Lord, the truth is that you make a way. You make a way by grace through all these things. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us today. Thank you for watching over our families at this time of year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.